Hey y'all, new day, new verses. We continue on into Isaiah. Today we're going to be picking up with chapter 31 and just having some fun with the whole chapter. And let's just get into it together and have a blast. Father God, we welcome you in this place. We welcome your presence. We welcome your wisdom. We welcome your authority. We ask that you would lead us and guide us and shape us and renew us. That you would shape our minds and give us direction and wisdom. That in a world of confusion, we may not stumble. In a world of frustration, we might have peace. And in a world of heartache, we might know your joy. Lord, you have placed us at such a time and place as this to be a city on a hill. Use us as such and refine us. That the power of your word be seen true power of who you are in our lives be seen and known that all might come running and worshiping you through faith and testimony lord god in jesus name amen and sorry if you can hear the puppy going off at all i'm not sure what one of our neighbors is working and he's a little bit of a protective guard doggy so sometimes he likes to bark anyway let's get into it and have some fun with chapter 31 verse 1 what sorrow awaits those who look to egypt for help trusting their horses, chariots, and charioteers, and depending on the strength of human armies, instead of looking to Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. In his wisdom, Yahweh will send great disaster. He will not change his mind. He will rise against the wicked and against their helpers. For these Egyptians are mere humans, not God. Then their horses are puny flesh, not mighty spirits. When Yahweh raises his fist against them, those who help will stumble, and those being helped will fall. They will all fall down and die together. But this is what Yahweh has told me. When a strong young lion stands growling over a sheep it is killed, it is not frightened by the shouts and noise of a whole crowd of shepherds. In the same way, Yahweh, the Lord of Heaven's armies, will come down and fight on Mount Zion. The Lord of Heaven's armies will hover over Jerusalem and protect it like a bird protecting its nest. He will defend and save the city. He will pass over and rescue it. Though you are such wicked rebels, my people, come and return to the Lord. I know the glorious day will come when each of you will throw away your gold idols and silver images your sinful hands have made. The Assyrians will be destroyed but not by the swords of men. The sword of God will strike them. Then they will panic and flee. The strong young Assyrians will be taken away as captives. Even the strongest will quake with terror. And princes will flee when they see your battle flags, says Yahweh. Those, who, that was, says the Lord, whose fire burns in Zion, whose flame blazes from Jerusalem. And I know the last little bit we've been going through verse by verse, and that's why I encourage all of you, keep reading these and rereading them and going over them over again, because it really is like the facets of a diamond. It really is like the beautiful images in a kaleidoscope. The more you turn it, the more you see. The more you go over it, the more that's revealed. Because taking this letter, or, the, or this, this section of Isaiah, sorry, not let, well, this, <laughs> prophecies of Isaiah, taking it as a whole, the individual, there's always more to dig in. Because the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and he will cleave what needs to be cleaned away, sword from spirit, or soul from spirit, you know, bone and sinew. He gets right to the core of what needs to be fixed. Us. The heart. Moses talked about a, circ a circumcision of it. And Ezekiel was described on the heart. Uh, uh, Jeremiah. A new heart of flesh. Although Ezekiel was the new heart of flesh, Jeremiah was Torah written on the heart. Sorry, got him backwards. <laughs> they, they all come together sometimes because it's this brilliantly intricate idea that's at the same time simple and profound. The heart needs to be fixed, and the only one who can fix it is the one who make it. The one who makes it. We don't make ourselves. We don't save ourselves. We are clay in the potter's hands. And as he shapes us, as he refines us, as he renews our being, we're able to bear out that glory, refined into a chalice that's been cleaned inside and out. It's all his doing. We're trusting him to do it. And that in and of itself is an act of faith. Because this is a God we cannot see. Right? I mean, we're told not to make items or idols and stuff like that for a reason. Because you can't reduce the creator of everything down to a single created thing. 
It takes away from And that's why I feel so horrible when we do it to human beings. Because we try and reduce this beautiful image bearer down to a label, down to a moment, down to a mistake, down to what we decide is their definition rather than looking at them as God has defined them. His own. His creation. His, his believe in our mouths and confess with our tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's it. That's what unites us. It's not the writ, the right, the hop up and down, the hopscotch or anything else. It's trusting in the Lord to do it. And that gets right into the beauty of this chapter that is written for us, not to us. We know who this section is written to, just like all of this text is written for us, not necessarily to us. And when we remember who it's written to and that, and that it's written for, we can start gleaning more. Because this whole idea, well, Egypt's not really even a, a power on the world stage right now. That's not knocking it as a nation. That's just top 10 countries. It's not really up there right now. Not compared to the day it was here. Assyria, not really even a nation anymore <laughs> or a kingdom. It's gone. The remnants of it are archaeological ruins at this point. There are cities around those areas, but They've been taken out. They've been turned to dust. I mean, one of the few cities that still has active people living in it is the city of David. Which, to me, goes to speak about how much God has said, no, this is my place, this is my people, I'm going to watch over them. That these words to them are to keep in mind that, yeah, God is sovereign. God is in control. Written for us to remind us, God is sovereign. God is in control. Because while he's warning all of these people about the futility, Isaiah is warning about all the futility of relying on Egypt, relying on human strength, or horsepower, relying on chariots, tanks, relying on wind, you know, planes. You know, pick your equivalent. Because they're focusing on the wrong thing. They think their military might give some strength, and it doesn't. Now, Syria is going to fold up and fold away. And we know here in the time and now, several thousand years at this point after Isaiah, and we can see, yeah, Syria, uh, Syria was completely wiped out. Egypt has been made into a joke of its former self. Comparing, comparing, like, compared to the beauty it once was. And the reason for that is because of wrong focus. The nations that exalt themselves and go, hey, we're the best, always get smacked down. Because God exalts the humble and humbles the proud. And then so relying on human strength, relying on human armies, relying on our own way of doing it, our own definitions, instead of turning to the Lord, we commit the same sins. Because like we were talking about last week, archetypes. Egypt is an archetype. Assyria, an archetype. Pharaoh, an archetype. It's looking at the characters and the story, taking this entire beautiful library as a book and vice versa. Looking at every single place where it comes together, the, the play on words, the hints, the nods, the interconnectedness. That it truly is a woven tapestry of mind-boggling beauty. It's because it's the work of his hand working through and with people to make this beautiful thing. That's the difference. That's the beauty of this chapter about the frustrations of what happens. Because when the world, when the body, when, when the people rely on human strength, human strength dries up. Even Jesus himself, he didn't trust them because he knew it was in their hearts, not the Lord's. His work that makes us. It's His work that saves us. It's simple trust in Him. Not trying to chow down on the knowledge of good and evil and defining what we deem right or what we deem sin. And then running to Him. Asking Him. Turning to Him. Because right here, yeah, the nation that rises up and tries to do it, it's going to get smacked. And Jerusalem got smacked. And the Babylonian exile was a thing. And it came with the second temple, the opportunity for us to hold this beautifully interwoven work that we have now. And smacked again in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple. Because the new thing the Lord had done, has done, is active and moving. And it's different. And hopefully a call that we can start living together. Because hey, Jerusalem is still taken care of. Israel is still God's. 
And the city of David still stands. And it doesn't matter how many people yell and scream and shout and try and blow it up, because I remember in the 2000s there was a missile strike that was completely blocked from hitting. The missiles smacked out of the air. They never even touched Israel. And God does that consistently, not just in a historical standpoint, in the now and in the here and in the future to come, because He is a consistent God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is how amazing our God is, is that He finds us in our weak place, finds us in our brokenness, finds us when we are nothings. When we're shepherds, boy, youngest in the family, runts, David. When we're the proud child, all but the youngest, has dreams and ideas and gets sold off because, well, you weren't quite getting with the program, kiddo, and Joseph. And that God finds us where we are, still dead to ourselves, still dead to Him, still dead in sin, and leads us to the life we could have. He meets us where we are and takes us to where we could go. And where we go is the choice we get. How far do we want to follow? How far do we want to go? Because if we are totally sold out to this, in the same way that He has sold out to us, in that He gave it all, that Jesus died for us. If we live like that, we can rejoice and let the rest of it go because we're trusting in His hand. We're knowing that He is a bird, as like a bird, protecting His nest. He is like a mother hen protecting His chick. I mean, Jesus said that Himself. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, a city that kills prophets, how often I've longed to gather you like chicks underneath a mother hen's wing. Same consistent God waiting for all of us to take a moment and realize blessing is there. We just need to chase after it. And not in an, oh, I'll never get the stick, oh, I'll not, but in the sense of walking in a dance. The song of songs and proverbs is there for beautiful understanding and reason. Is it racy Hebrew love poetry? Heck yeah. Is it also a beautiful understanding of the idea of the movement? So that the imagery of Hosea's marriage gets even deeper into the idea of covenant. Because he had to marry Gomer, a prostitute, or an unfaithful partner. And he stayed. And he took care of her. And he did it anyway. Because he met her where she was. And loved her anyway. Just like God does the same for us. Religion will tell us that we're supposed to jump through hoops and do it a certain way and all this and that. And God himself says, come as you are to worship. All our rags are his filthy righteousness. And yet when we stand up and start going, oh, mine is the best, oh, mine is better. The world argues over the wrong kind, over flags when we have a banner. It's not doing away with them, it's rejoicing that we get to come together. Not relying on human strength. Standing arm in arm with our fellow man, relying on God. There is a difference. The difference is where we go first. Do we go to another person for gossip and sharing it all and getting it out, or do we go to God first? Do we go to the Word first? Do we get rid of the golden idols? Do we get rid of the silver nothings? You know, oh, well, I know I'm supposed to do this, but if I do that, it won't come to this result. How do you know? We don't know the future. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't even know where the next breath comes from or when we'll get it. Unless we know that God is the one giving it. It's not about our definitions. It's about simple trust. Children relying on their Father. On our Abba Father in Heaven. Whose name is Holy. And when we forget that, we run it through the mud when we say He is our banner. Nisi, right, it means banner. And you've got in this idea the battle flags, and the flags for each nation. Game of Thrones, right, the Stark flag, the Stark banner. I'm really glad the certain aspects of nerd culture are starting to pick up and seep through things so the conversations like this get a little easier. 
Because this idea of even the strongest princes of the world will flee when they see your battle flags. Assyria is an archetype. It is looking like and referencing to a demonically influenced fleshy evil. Rebellion of man and spirit thumbing their noses at God. Pharaoh doing the same thing. And in Jesus' day, Jerusalem doing it too. That's why Jesus said what he said. Why, Jer why he quoted Jeremiah who said what he said. Because it had become a form of open rebellion against God because their own definitions were more important than God's. Their own tassels more important than the people that were desperate to grab hold of them. That's the problem. That's what needs to be remedied. That's what needs to be fixed. The heart. Not relying on human inventions, not relying on human creation, not relying on human things, relying on the Lord. Because we're in a wilderness, when we're in a wilderness season, He's the one who keeps the shoes from wearing out. He's the one who makes sure we are fed. He's the one who makes sure that there's clothing. He's the one who takes care of it. And it breaks my heart that we are a nation that is supposedly a nation that serves God, yet we do not act as such. We don't. We'll give millions of aid to other nations, but ignore our own streets. We'll send people on missions all over the world, but we'll ignore our next door neighbor. We'll make sure that we have all of the great concerts and wonderful bands and musicians to rival the secular world, but we'll look no different. Because the heart is what needs to change. A heart that is no longer in rebellion against the Lord, trying to use its own definitions, its own strengths, its own functions to say, this is the way I define the world. My box, my land, my square, and screw the rest. Because that has worked out so well for the last how many thousands of years? You take any time a scale you want. I prefer the shorter ones because it makes us look less dumb. It means we haven't had hundreds of thousands of years to screw up in the same way. And yet God meets us where we are and helps refine us so that we can get to the place where, oh hey, I don't have to do it that way. And it feels like an Erdo moment in hindsight where when we're looking at it, it's so hard because the forest is through the trees because the idols are always right there in front of us. Fame, power, fortune, money, sex. Not much has changed. None of those are things that we should pursue. Hell, each and of them by themselves aren't bad. Sex is a beautiful gift. Money is a way we can use to help people out. If you're heard, you have a better stance to be able to speak to more. It's when they become the end goal. It's when the ends justify the means. It's when we deem who the one who suffers is. I, I love Star Trek and back into that nerd culture, right? Wrath of Khan. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. It's a logical axiom. As long as the few or the one are the ones deciding that. When the many decides who the few or the one are, it's murder. And it has always been murder. No different than stoning Stephen. No different than caving, caving Abel Skullin. It's the same repeated game. And it's the same rebellious game that happens every single time we start worshipping him as idols. When we, the image bearer, forget that we are an image, we don't worship them. We have to chase down God. He's right here waiting for us to turn to him. We don't have to do something for God to love us. He always has, he always will, and he always does. 
simply stop running to our sin as though it were the best thing that ever happened to us. We stop craving Egyptian meat when we forget that it came with Egyptian chains. We don't crave Assyrian power because we know it comes to nothing in the end. Not but ruin, barren waste, where goats frolic and wolves hunt. Is that is what has become of Assyria. That is what has become of the nation of Babylon. That is what has become the once great kingdom of Rome. They all fell because they all fall. Because when a nation exalts itself, it must be humbled. If it happened to the city that bears his name, what makes us think any nation's getting out of that one without getting a rap on the knuckles when it's needed? But that is the justice we hope for. That is the justice we long for. The wrongs being righted. The divided being brought together. The broken being healed. That is what the Lord does. It's trusting in Him to do it. It's trusting that He is our banner. So that when the enemy attacks whether it be spiritual onslaught, because they are real, whether it be the physical brothers and sisters coming to smash our hands in, because that's real, whatever the wind or the wave or the storm may be, because we are anchored to the rock, the storm merely bats against the house and goes away. We are safe from the storm because our God stills wind and wave with but a word. If we truly trust that He is sovereign and good, then no matter what the situation sees in our storm, we can trust that He is in it with us and rebuke the enemy away from us. A loud no to the enemy and he flees. Quiet, yes, because God's already there. Listening, waiting, His ear turned. When we shed our sins, drop the idols, and leave our old self behind in the grave where it belongs, we can go running right into our Alpha's lap. Where we were always supposed to be. The Assyrians, whatever that enemy may be called in your life, poverty, drunkenness, hurting, poor wrath, envy, callousness, cruelty, or hell, it could just be you're so damn tired you don't even want to be alive right now. You're just tired and wondering how you're going to get from the beginning of day to the end of the day without breaking down, breaking out, or just sobbing. God knows. I may not. I may never know you from Adam, but He knows. He knows us both. He knows us more intimately than we know ourselves and knows the trials we are going through better than we do. And with His Holy Spirit in us, He's already making sighs out of our prayers, out of our aching sighs and groans. That is who our banner is. That is the name we carry in on our battle flags. Nisi, El Roy, Jaira, Yahweh, the Lord God is King. I know that Yahweh means, well, technically it's He will be, but... Because he is the I am for this syntax stuff. Focusing on the beauty here. He is Nisi. He is our banner. He is our miracle worker. And if we're living a life that truly believes that, others will see it. Not works we accomplish and focus on simply living, being ourselves. Putting everything about our lives, our comings, our goings, our day-to-day, -day, our eatings, our sleepings, even our goings, and putting it before the Lord, our whole life, an offering of saying, thank you for giving me this day. Please thank you for the daily bread, the forgiveness as we forgive others, protecting us from temptation, delivering us from the evil one, because that's who our Heavenly Father is. The banner we stand under, chicks protected by our mother hen, children protected by our father God, the imagery is so rich because it's trying to get such a profound idea. Such a simple one. Come to Jesus, all who are weary, that you might have rest. 
because as we saw a couple weeks ago, in quiet rest and strength will trust, that is where our salvation lies. It's written for us to see we only need rest in the King, bringing our everything and our all. Being okay when life, when it becomes with inconvenience is because how much more has Jesus inconvenienced himself by dying in our place? Something he did with joy. Something he did remembering each of us when he went there. That is the God we serve. That is the banner that unites us all. That miracle, that moment, that mercy is what unites us all. And how dare we shred up the banner just because we want our own little patch instead of doing the exact opposite, the upside down side of it, the real side of it that we're supposed to do. Each person bringing that muchness of themselves, each nation, each tribe, each tongue bringing their muchness and giving it in devotion to the Lord. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will inherit the earth. We are called to make peace because Jesus has made peace with us. God, Yahweh, that is who Jesus is, perfectly God and perfectly man. The Son has made a way. Yahweh, the way maker, has made a way. So that every tribe, every tongue, every nation, everyone can confess He is Lord, can drop that Wait, they were atlas stone they were never supposed to carry and run free. That none should perish, that all might live. This is the story we get to share. The story that unites us all. The story that says, yes, God gave you your muchness and wants to dance with you as he makes it blossom and bloom into something more. Something more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. As he refines your lev, scrubs your nefesh, and blooms your mode. Renews your heart, strengthens your soul, and gives you new strength. Not as fun as the Hebrew for myself, but welcome just the same. Because it's who he is. Our quiet place, our safe refuge, our treasure, Lord. He is. We need only rest in the King because His fire burns in Zion, in that new Jerusalem, the place He calls in each one of us when we are His. He blazes out from the city of peace, welcoming us in. And as we continue on through this week, I invite you into looking into these verses we're going into and reading New Jerusalem in Revelation, as I think you'll see some beautiful parallels that have been blowing my mind. Ones that I know go even deeper than I can see. He invites us to live in peace. He's already made the way. Gotta follow him and let him. The sheep, responsive to the shepherd's voice. May his favor be upon you. Know that you're loved and never give up hope. He gave you this day He'll get you through the week he's got for you, and he'll see you through. I'll see you then.